Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to what is the kickoff event for what will be a year-long set of celebratory events uh, that we're going to have here in 2013. Um, I'm Eric Green, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and we are delighted to see all of you here and to start uh, this 2013 year uh, today uh, with respect to what are going to be some pretty amazing things uh, to celebrate what we want to celebrate in 2013. Let me just remind you what a historic year this is really going to be. We are celebrating the 60th anniversary of this Watson Crick discovery, the double helical structure of DNA in this famous publication in Nature in 1953. Probably more near and dear to our hearts at NHGRI, and certainly as you will hear from the speakers today, we're also celebrating the 10th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project, uh, which will truly be at the 10th anniversary this coming April. Uh, to commemorate uh, this historic year, uh, NHGRI has programmatically planned a number of things that I just want to briefly share with you so that you're aware. Um, and in fact, uh, all of this uh, that is, is showcased here on this slide um, uh, is being led by uh, my special thanks to Rudy Pizzotti and Brad Ozenberger, who have co-chaired a committee of people from NHGRI that have put together programs uh, for the next handful of months. Um, to really celebrate uh, this remarkable year that we're having. Um, it really consists of two things uh, that I want to make sure you're aware of. They're shown over here, and these are posters you'll see on campus. Um, there are a series of uh, three paired lectures. Today is the first of three. You can see there'll be uh, a couple of other ones coming up in subsequent months. And then on April 25th will be a day long, and by the way, those paired lectures will be held um, here. Um, and then on April 25th is a day long symposium over in the Natura Conference Center um, that will feature a number of very outstanding speakers to really have uh, a day-long look at uh, the genomics landscape a decade after the Human Genome Project. Uh, these are the events we have uh, planned um, immediately here on campus. I would actually point you uh, to this website if you're interested in following these and more. It's a very simple URL, genome.gov backslash HEP10 which will also eventually have links to videos of all of these talks and the day-long symposium, and we'll have other programming uh, events that will be uh, coming um, as the year goes on. So if there's one place you want to look to to sort of see a roadmap of what's going to happen, I would point you there. One of the things that is already uh, described um, on, on this particular website, it's this very last link here, is the final thing I just want to tell you about. Um, uh, those of you who have not heard, uh, NHGRI has forged a major partnership with the National um, Museum of Natural History, this at the, from the Smithsonian Institute, uh, to create um, a genome exhibition uh, to commemorate these two important milestones in 2013. And this uh, remarkable new genomics exhibit is at a very late stage of, of, of design and will go to fabrication in the coming weeks. And I'm pleased to tell you that opening in mid-June of this year, at that museum will be this exhibition, uh, Genome Unlocking Life's Code. Uh, this has been a remarkable uh, partnership and collaboration with them. Um, this will be resident in Hall 23. It's easy to remember because we have humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Hall 23 of the museum, and it's immediately adjacent uh, to the Hope Diamond. So it's just follow the crowds to the Hope Diamond and take a left. And uh, you'll find this. It'll be there for one year from roughly June until the following summer and then it will be touring around North America for probably four or five years. And we're expecting great things of this exhibition, I can tell you, by reviewing the design. It's something you absolutely want to make sure that you see while it's here in the D.C. area. And in fact, Nature also acknowledged it in their first issue of 2013. They gave a nice shout out as it being one of the hot tickets for 2013 in science and art, and that's this exhibition that will be opening at the Smithsonian. So where we are is the kickoff. We're right here. We're at this very first event of what's going to be a series of events. And I could tell you that I could think of, I, I couldn't think of two more appropriate people to kick off our year-long celebration of the 10th anniversary of completing the Human Genome Project than today's speakers. Uh, these genomics pioneers have truly shaped the field of genomics as we know it today. So one of the speakers is Dr. Robert Waterston, Bob Waterston, who's currently professor and chair of the Department of Genome Sciences at the University of Washington. In his role as the William H. Gates III Endowed Chair of Biomedical Sciences, he is currently leading research into the genetic control of development in the nematode worm. His recent research accomplishments have resulted in the development of a novel technology to decipher automatically the dynamic expression of genes within, with single cell resolution and minute uh, time resolution. 
And as part of NHGRI's modern code project, he and his collaborators have collected data that accurately defines the complement of both protein coding and many non-coding non genes in the nematode worm. But prior to his arrival at the University of Washington in 2003, Bob established and directed the Genome Sequencing Center at Washington University in St. Louis for many years. Partnering with the group headed by our second speaker, who I'll talk about in a minute, the waterston salston combo completed the sequence of the nematode worm genome before turning their attention to sequencing the human genome, all part of the Human Genome Project. Now, Bob's foray into genetics and molecular biology started under the tutelage of Nobel Prize winner Dr. Sidney Brenner in Cambridge, and there he worked to understand life at the molecular level through studying the nematode worm, C. elegans, along with, guess who, uh, John Salston. So turning our attention to Sir John Salston, who you see on the screen up here, and I'll, have an, I'll explain that in a minute, is currently chair of the University of Manchester's Institute for Science, Ethics, and Innovation which was established with the mission to observe and analyze the role and responsibilities of science and innovation. The Institute examines the ways in which science is used in the 21st century to evaluate possible or desirable changes and to consider the forms of regulation and control of the process that are appropriate or desired. Now, prior to his arrival at the University of Manchester, John was the founding director of the Wellcome Trust Sanger Center from 1992 to 2000, where he led a highly productive genome sequencing group that first sequenced the worm genome in partnership with Bob's group at Washington University, and later contributed greatly to the sequence of the human genome, again, all part of the Human Genome Project. Then in 2002, we co-authored the book The Common Thread with Georgina Ferry, an account of the science, politics, and ethics of the Human Genome Project. Uh, Sir John is also a fellow of the Royal Society and an honorary fellow of in Pembroke College in Cambridge. Prior to the Human Genome Project, John, like Bob, worked for many years in the biology of C. elegans, in particular establishing the precise lineages of all of its cells. And for this work, uh, John was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2002, jointly with Sidney Brenner and Bob Horvitz. But let me emphasize why we wanted to kick off our celebratory year with these two accomplished genomics researchers. The historical accounts of the Human Genome Project um, are already describing the contributions of the project as being at least twofold. I mean, first and foremost, of course, they generated the first reference sequence of the genome, the human genome, and those of model organisms, such as the nematode worm. But really, the second thing historians are already saying about the Human Genome Project is how it began to change the culture of biomedical research, in particular with respect to the free and open sharing of scientific data. And I would tell you, and I was there, Bob and John are widely regarded as the icons of leadership that led to the second important contribution of the Human Genome Project. And I think as you'll hear from both of them, they brought the social norm of open data sharing from the nematode research community to the more rough and tumble human genomics arena, persuasively arguing for free release of human genome sequence during its generation by the Human Genome Project. I can tell you their voices were influential in establishing the Bermuda principles on data sharing that you will hear about shortly. Well, in the past uh, few years, Bob and John have jointly won numerous awards for their scientific work and their support for the scientific community, including the Gardner Award, the General Motors Prize, the Dan David Prize, and the George Beadle Medal in the Genom Genetic Society of America. And Bob also uh, received the Gruber Prize in genetics. Well, before I turn the podium over to, to Bob and John, let me just set the stage with a couple of additional things. First of all, we have I absolutely wanted these two to kick off uh, this year-long set of events. I thought it was perfect to start that way. Due to some challenges, um, uh, it was difficult for, for John Sulston to be here in person. But, you know, we're an HGRI. We don't let little things get in our way. We just figure out solutions. And the solution was let's just bring him in um, by video. And so John will be on the screen, and there'll be all sorts of heroic things going on back there to make sure that everything's uh, being shown appropriately, and each person is going to be talking, and we don't actually even know how all this is going to work necessarily. Uh, we were fortunate that Bob Waterston is here in person, so we're going to have this tandem of one speaker by video. By the way, video directly from the Sanger, what is now the Sanger Institute, seeming very appropriate that we would directly link the Sanger Institute uh, here with NIH for this, uh, this paired lecture. So that's why one's in person and one, one, is, uh, one is remote. But I also thought before I would turn the, 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 the podium over, I also thought I would set the stage for what I fully anticipate you'll hear about. And, and um, I'm a bit of, a, of an archivist myself, especially of photographs. 
and I dug and dug and dug of what I had um, and found a few photographs that I think in many ways capture some of the things you're going to hear about. So I'm just going to set the stage by just sharing a couple. We're going to hear about these Bermuda meetings that took place. And I just happened to find I had photographs. I actually couldn't find any photographs of Bob. I know he was there. But here, and, and John, John Sulston, you can't see these, but we have a very flattering picture of you, both individually, as well as in a group photo with some of the key uh, people that uh, were there and heavily involved in issues surrounding data release and data generation as part of the Human Genome Project. So that was 1998. And actually, one could easily conclude by looking at this picture and looking at John Sulston over on the video that he has not aged a bit since 1998. It is truly <laughs> remarkable. The other thing I will tell you about uh, John and Bob uh, having been there on the front line of the Genome Project from beginning to end is they were also sort of the icons for reason and for, um, for advice. And this is a photograph that from the Cold Spring Harbor Genome Biology Meeting or whatever it was called. It was probably called the, the Genome Mapping and Sequencing back then in 1998. This was taken very late at night. In fact, chances are it was probably taken in the, probably in the early morning, I suspect right there in the dining hall of Cold Spring Harbor. I may see a lot into this, and I suspect Bob Waterston, and John can't see this photo, would, 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 if they remember it, would see a lot of emotion in this photograph. First of all, there's a lot of uh, alcohol being consumed. You can see that. But uh, people didn't look particularly happy. And these were all senior members of the Genome Sequencing Center at Washington University. These were all people working with Bob. Um, uh, and it was 1998. Anybody who thinks the Genome Project mm -hmm. from beginning to end, everything was simple, and that everything was solved, <laughs> and that there was never any frustration or anger. Apparently, you, um, you weren't there. And this was one of those moments where things were tough, things were confusing, there was a lot of politics in the air, there was a lot of hard decisions about how quick to scale up the sequencing of the human genome, how to do it, what the right strategy should be. And these scientific, or actually are all now sci all scientific leaders, including there's Rick Wilson uh, with uh, actually his, his head in his hand, who's now the director of the WashU Sequencing Center. And these other folks have major positions both in um, academic centers and at least one in the case in, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. And sat there talking to Bob and John, and basically Bob and John sat there and talked to all of us. I was there too. I was taking the picture. Talked us off the ledge because the frustration was so high and it was just another example of their leadership of just sort of keeping the ship very calm even during turbulent waters at moments where it seemed like things were not going so well. Um, happier days did come, as we all know, and this other photo, which has been widely shown, I know, is a photo I happen to cap capture of the two of them looking much happier now. And uh, this was actually <laughs> the first meeting, what is now um, an annual meeting that takes place in Marco Island in February of every year. It was actually the first annual. Um, and they came, and it was a much happier time with the genome sequencing efforts for human being well on track um, and nearing a, a draft stage, and uh, things were good then. And, but again, they were looked to so much for leadership and for uh, mentorship of folks that had really basically launched their careers by participating in the Human Genome Project and needed their guidance uh, along the way. So with those three images in mind, um, let me now uh, jo please join me in uh, welcoming Bob Waterston and John Sulston, and to thank them for their vision and leadership that has been so instrumental for making genomics the vital scientific discipline that it is today. So, Bob, I think you're going to start, right? Oh, well, thanks very much uh, for the kind introduction, and uh, I'll have to get a picture of, uh, I'll have to get a copy of the Cold Spring Harbor picture. Uh, that was indeed a tense night. Uh, okay, so uh, as Eric said, uh, John and I are going to uh, do a tandem here. Uh, I'll do the first half, uh, and, uh, and John will do the second. Uh, we'll have a, more or less a worm's eye view of the Human Genome Project that we're going to share with you today. Uh, and, uh, and my part will be uh, taking you uh, looking, looking back a bit, uh, and John uh, will will take us uh, forward uh, talking about the, some of the implications uh, and if, uh, of, of what we did, in t especially in terms of data release. Um, and if the technology all works, uh, John will actually be able to talk a little bit during mine. John, can you see me? Yes. Hi, oh, Bob. Good. All right. Excellent. So, <laughs> so uh, he, uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll try to uh, comment a little bit on each other's talks. 
All right, so uh, the, the main character today uh, is uh, indeed C. Elegans. Uh, that's the star of the show. Uh, this, was the, this is the nematode worm that uh, Sidney Brenner, whoops, he, it won't, it's not crawling, it's, it's an unk mutant. So, okay. Uh, this is the nematode worm that Sidney Brenner uh, chose as his model organism in the, in the 60s uh, because of the great genetics and its simplicity. Uh, you can see on the left uh, the egg developing. Uh, when it flips back, uh, it starts at about the, the 16 cell stage uh, and uh, does all this in about 12 hours. Uh, and as Eric mentioned, uh, John figured out the lineage of the, of the worm. Uh, every, every worm goes through exactly the same pattern of cell divisions uh, uh, in the early eight, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, but it hatches and has uh, interesting behavior. It crawls across the plate and sniffs and poops and eats and all kinds of interesting things. Uh, and uh, does all this with 302 neurons. Uh, the complete circuitry of those th 302 neurons was worked out by uh, John White and his team. Uh, also in the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s. So uh, all of this is uh, known in great detail. Uh, Let's see, can I? Anyway, uh, so uh, for all this, uh, there were an uh, increasing number of scientists uh, trying to use the genetics to identify genes that affected the development, affected the behavior. Uh, and because the genetics was so powerful, uh, the genes flowed. Uh, but the, the challenge became uh, cloning those genes. Uh, the method at the time, uh, the, there were really two options. One was uh, chromosome, was transposon tagging, and that was, uh, didn't always work, and you had to find mutants all over again. And the other one was chromosome walking, where you started from one place on the genome and uh, through a laborious and tedious process, you would find a series of clones and eventually, hopefully, end up uh, at your gene. Let's see. It doesn't want to advance at the moment, but we'll get it to. There we go. Um, uh, our colleagues uh, and rivals in the Drosophila uh, community uh, had a huge uh, advantage in doing this kind of operation. They had polyteen chromosomes where the whole genome uh, is laid out for you. Uh, each chromosome uh, in its linear order uh, and big enough to, to resolve so that uh, each band basically represents a gene uh, and you could pick out where the genes were. And in terms of chromosome walking, uh, this was uh, a huge uh, advantage. Worm, cho worm chromosomes, by contrast, are tiny. Uh, they're just little smudges. Uh, and cyto cytogenetics uh, was, was uh, very poor. Fortunately, uh, large, large insert clones and genomic libraries came along at the time uh, so that with Cosmids, uh, they had a 40,000 base insert, 40 KB, so that uh, just 2,500 clones uh, could represent the whole genome if you had the exact right uh, 2,500 clones. Uh, and John uh, recognized the possibility of this and uh, in 1983 at the worm meeting, discussed the possibilities, and by uh, 1984 here, uh, spring of 1984, uh, he announced his, his intentions. Uh, by this time, he'd been joined by Alan Coulson, uh, and they announced their intention of uh, trying to construct a physical map of the worm genome. Now, this is a cover of the Worm Breeders Gazette in which they announced this, their project to the worm community. Uh, and this deserves a little bit of comment uh, in terms of uh, just the community. Uh, so the Worm Breeders Gazette came out every six months, uh, except uh, on the on the every other year when the worm meet, when the annual or when the international uh, worm meeting took place. And and it was a vehicle for uh, particularly for 
the postdocs who from Cambridge uh, who had gone off to s uh, start their own labs. I was in St. Louis uh, feeling very lonely, uh, having left the, uh, the nest uh, at Cambridge. Uh, mm. And I look forward uh, to getting my Worm Breeders Gazette every, every six months to figure out uh, what everybody else was doing, uh, in, uh, especially there in Cambridge. Uh, the idea of sharing like this, though, uh, and these were all pre-publication. You are not uh, supposed to cite these. Uh, they, were, they were simply uh, to, to share information. This is not a new idea, though. Uh, is, this is a quote from uh, Ben Franklin, uh, quoted in Common as Air by Lewis Hyde. And in particular, I, this part, uh, he was talking about his experiments on electricity. I ought to keep them by me till corrected and improved by time and further experience. But since even short hints and imperfect experiments in a new branch of science being communicated have oftentimes a good effect in exciting the ingenious to, sub to, to the subject and so becoming the occasion of more exact disquisitions and more complete discoveries. So it was in this spirit uh, of, the, of the Worm Breeders get Gazette and this uh, sense of sharing that uh, Alan and John uh, outlined their program here. And in particular, uh, they, they talked about how they were going to uh, uh, map the clones and overlap them and so forth. But uh, importantly, the, this was part of it. It is clear from the outset that the physical map will only become a reality as a communal project. In its final stages, it will have to be completed opportunistically, and in any case, numerous markers will be required to align it with the genetic map. We therefore invite anyone who has genetically positioned DNA that is larger than 10 KB in length and available for distribution to collaborate with us by sending a sample for fingerprinting and comparison with the database. In return, we can send you any flanking cosmids that we find, as well as any others you need. So it was not just simply uh, telling the world, but it was inviting uh, the whole community uh, to participate in this project. And uh, I hope this slide gives you an idea of what was involved. So we're starting out with uh, the whole chromosome, the DNA. Uh, and by comparing one insert to another, John and Alan were able to uh, get a series of overlapping clones, uh, a minimum path through that represented by the clones in red here. So this is the physical map uh, that John and Alan were working on. Meanwhile, the community was working on the genetic map, placing a gene here with a marker here, and maybe they had a, a let's see, maybe they had a gene of interest here, okay? Uh, they made the connection of gene one and the marker here, so therefore gene X had to lie somewhere in between and indeed, uh, by tests, you could show that that was the case. And, and so this, this joint effort between uh, John and Alan and, uh, and the community uh, was producing the map. I don't, John, do you want to comment any more on that? Um, yes, I, I think we, although we'll go on quickly to the, um, the further joining, at this stage, we, we had quite limited um, mapping. We had 700 gaps, so these chunks on average were only just over 100 kilobases. And so we had to have rather a strong etiquette about who, whose rights were involved when people gave data. Because obviously if somebody had identified the island by gene one, then the person with gene X was, was very heavily dependent on them. So we, we had quite a lot of toing and froing, and this is one of the things that taught us how you have to have the right kind of etiquette uh, to, to do these things. Uh, but I would just emphasize once again, as Bob has, the virtuous circle of, of, the, of the community and the central mapping labs going back and forth, back and forth between the two sorts of map. Over to you, Bob. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, the map was not perfect, as John said. Uh, the, one of the problems was, uh, oh, so and then, of course, they were able to go ahead and sequence that. But one of the challenges was that uh, they, they had uh, fragments or uh, islands of, of clones that they weren't able to associate uh, with, the, with the genetic map because they had no markers on it. But 
also because they had no linking clones. And as John mentioned, uh, there were some 700 gaps at the time uh, when I joined, when I uh, came over on sabbatical. Uh, and I have to confess, uh, I don't know if John actually knows this, but when I came on sabbatical, uh, I was nominally supposed to work on uh, finding new muscle, new, new genes affecting muscle, <laughs> but in the back of my head all along, I had the hope that uh, I would be able to contribute uh, to the map. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Maynard Olson was in the lab next door to me at Wash U, uh, was working uh, hard and, uh, and dedicatedly on the yeast map. And so I was uh, strongly inculcated with this, uh, with the mapping uh, spirit. Uh, and when I went to the LMB uh, for my sabbatical, uh, John was kind enough to, to take me into his lab uh, or because uh, the main worm lab didn't, didn't actually have any space. So I had to, I had to find a home and John uh, provided me one. Uh, and so it was this challenge of uh, trying to link up uh, these bits of pieces and close these gaps uh, that was confronting them at the time. Uh, I tried several things, but uh, actually about the, t uh, the summer before I left, uh, the solution started to emerge uh, from Maynard's lab. Uh, I went and visited, and there a graduate student, David Burke, had begun to develop uh, yeast artificial chromosomes. Uh, and indeed, uh, shortly after I got back home, uh, I made a, uh, a worm yak library. Uh, I think it was uh, one of the first libraries made. Uh, in fact, it was made in parallel with the first human library. David was kind enough to uh, take me along for the ride. And once we had those, uh, with Yuji Kohara's help, who was a visitor in John's lab after I left, uh, we were able to position the yaks by hybridization against the existing uh, clones in the map, as well as tie in these flanking ones. Uh, and, the yet, and the yaks uh, indeed bridged the gap. Uh, the advantage was that yeast was a different system, a eukaryote, uh, and these were single copy. Uh, we, we're not fully sure what the reasons are, uh, but these bits of DNA that E. coli didn't like uh, were certainly tolerated well in yeast. So uh, this went on very quickly. Uh, basically, within a year after we had the full, uh, a good uh, yak library, uh, we were able to uh, tie things together. Uh, came, we, instead of making a, a, a competing efforts, uh, we joined forces with John and Alan. Uh, we did one set of hybridizations, they did the other. Uh, and by the end of, uh, by the end of, uh, or middle of 19, end of 1988, uh, we had uh, a, a much more complete map. And so here, you can see the six chromosomes of the worm. There's still a few gaps here, uh, but uh, you can see all the markers that have the community is placed on here. Uh, it's getting to be uh, indeed a quite respectable uh, map. And by 1989, at the worm meeting, uh, Alan uh, printed out all these things uh, on the uh, on this A A4 paper, uh, eight and a half by eleven sheets, basically pasted them all together. Uh, and so this is chromosome one along here, chromosome two, chromosome three, and you can see that uh, chromosomes two, three, four, five are, are more or less uh, fully complete. There's still a big gap here on chromosome one. Uh, there's a little piece of DNA sitting down here. Uh, so there's, there's still a few pieces left. Uh, but it was great fun uh, at that meeting because uh, everybody in the community were was using uh, these clones, and all meeting long, we had this up. People would come by, uh, they they find their way along the chromosome, and they'd start writing down the names of the of the clones that uh, can, that were in their neighborhood, uh, and then pretty soon they'd write uh, for the clone. Uh, so, and and many people, many of the talks uh, had exactly uh, had 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 advances because they had been able to clone their gene through this. So, uh, but we had a second 
secondary reason for posting the map uh, like this. By 1989, uh, the Human Genome Project was uh, beginning to take shape. Uh, the NRC report chaired by Bruce Alberts uh, had come out recommending that action on this as well as the Office of Technology Assessment report. Uh, and so the idea of sequencing uh, the human genome had indeed taken root uh, despite much opposition. Uh, the, the, both reports, uh, particularly the, the uh, National Academy report, uh, suggested the course of on human to start by developing maps uh, and, to, and to save sequencing for a later time, uh, but to use sequencing on uh, model organisms uh, with smaller and less complex genomes, hoping that there would be more bang for the buck in those, in, for those genomes. Uh, and this effort was going to be run jointly by the DOE and the NI, NIH. Uh, and by this time, uh, the NH NCHGR, I think it was, uh, had been formed. Uh, and Jim Watson, uh, who was still the director at Cold Spring Harbor, was appointed the first director of the center. Uh, and, and so, uh, for various reasons, uh, we were hoping that we could talk to Jim during the meeting. Uh, we could get him to come by and see the map. Uh, and, uh, and interest him in supporting uh, a joint effort between our two labs uh, to, to begin sequencing. And Jim, Jim, of course, had been interested in the idea of a complete description of genomes for a long time. Uh, in, in his book, uh, The Molecular Biology of Cell, in the first edition in 1965, uh, he has a, a, a chapter uh, called A Chemist's View of the Cell, and in it there's a whole section on the significance of a finite amount of DNA. And just as you saw in the polyteen chromosomes, I mean, that's all the information. This is digital information. It's no longer analog uh, and all its complexity. It's uh, digital information, and if you have the, have the order of the bases along those uh, strands, you have all the information uh, that it takes to make that organism. Uh, and and in, that, in that chapter, uh, Jim had already begun speculating about what it might take uh, to understand E. coli completely and uh, identify all of its genes. So fortunately, uh, Jim did see the map at the meeting. And uh, reportedly, when he saw it, he, his comment was, you can't look at something like this and not want to sequence it. So we thought, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, we did indeed have a meeting with, John, uh, with, with Jim. Uh, it was uh, John, me, uh, Alan, and I think Bob Horvitz uh, met with him, I think, on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, John, uh, you had the, the most bold proposal. Do you want to? Uh, tell people what you uh, suggested to Jim? Well, we, we talked a bit about this beforehand, I believe, but I, I was the fall guy who said to Jim, well, look, <laughs> you give us $100 million <laughs> and we'll do it. I mean, that was the price that Wally Gilbert had suggested for sequencing the human genome a little while before, a dollar a base. So we thought, yeah, we could do that. And indeed, uh, well, Jim replied, oh, that's not the way we do things here. <laughs> so we did that <laughs> something that way elsewhere. And of course, he was right, because in the end, we did it for a great deal less than $100 million. But anyway, we put the offer on the table to show he was serious. <laughs> Jim didn't, 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 didn't blink when John said, he said, <laughs> that's not the way we do things. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so... Um, but, but he did uh, say that uh, certainly N NCHGR would uh, entertain a proposal for, from us uh, for a pilot project uh, going for three years. Uh, and uh, and, and the, with the funding split, uh, two-thirds from the NIH and one-third from the MRC, uh, and indeed that's how it went down. So uh, with that, we were started. Uh, 
We were working closely, as illustrated in this cartoon from The New Scientist about uh, 1961 or two or something like that. Um, and uh, our plan at the time was basically to double our throughput every year. Uh, and actually, we did that uh, for a very long period of time. Uh, the project attracted very talented people uh, uh, in both labs. Uh, and uh, and, the, and at the same time, because this was obviously part of a, a much larger effort to, to improve sequencing, uh, there were better and better ways to sequence. So we were constantly revising plans, uh, tossing out something to re be replaced by something else, and at the same time uh, trying to keep up the throughput. I've, I've put a little note down here in the corner to remind me to tell you that uh, while initially uh, the map had been shared uh, by this Worm Breeders Gazette, as technology improved in the, in the late 80s, we started uh, sending around tapes and used the precursor of the internet, BitNet, uh, to communicate uh, with the community so that uh, Paul Sternberg on the West Coast had, uh, had tapes and uh, we in St. Louis had tapes, Bob Horvitz, uh, or Marty in, in, uh, on the East Coast had tapes uh, so that people could uh, access the map. And John uh, figured out how to send updates uh, automatically to the sites so that the community uh, could access the map. And as we began to sequence, uh, we did the same thing. Basically, as we, as we generated sequence and assembled it, uh, no matter what the state, uh, we basically started posting it on the web. Uh, by that time, there was a web, uh, and the internet was much more sophisticated. And we were we were fortunate to have uh, Richard Durbin and Jean Thierry Mig uh, develop a, a what's called, what was a C Elegans database, um, where we could display all this information uh, for the community over the web. And so basically, we had a, a an uh, you know almost live. Uh, representation of the sequence for the community. Uh, they knew where we were sequencing and which direction we were going. Uh, and so we had people say, well, you know, that's on chromosome two. You guys aren't going to sequence that until next year. Uh, we're going to we'll leave those genes. We're going to study the ones on chromosome three where, where you guys are already sequencing. Uh, and so we kept up uh, this spirit of collaboration uh, between the, 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 the central uh, genome facility uh, generating the raw data uh, the, the, and, and the community using it. Uh, and it was a great collaboration, sp uh, sped up uh, research uh, enormously, I think. Our successes uh, started to draw attention from uh, other sources. Uh, at WashU, we were approached by Merck uh, in, the, in the early 90s, uh, mid 90s, to, uh, to do ESTs. Uh, ESTs at the time were, were being held uh, uh, privately, uh, and Merck wanted to change that. Uh, they were willing to pay us to produce uh, sequences. They knew about our reputation of putting everything out online, and they were perfectly happy with us to generate these ESTs uh, and, uh, and deposit them. Uh, and so that's what we did. Uh, and by you can't remember, uh, we, we generated uh, hundreds of thousands of ESTs uh, speeding the discovery of human genes, uh, and not uh, incidentally uh, making all of this information uh, public uh, instead of having to subscribe to a private database. Uh, we also learned a lesson for the, that, uh, as Eric said, it's a rough, it's a, the human community is a little more rough and tumble. Uh, Venter's EST paper uh, used all of our ESDs, uh, and they equaled about what they had from their own. Uh, and so we, we hadn't uh, published on them yet, but they were out there, uh, so it was uh, probably fair use. Uh, but when we tried to publish our paper, Nature said, uh, well, we've already published them. So <laughs> it was a little frustrating. Uh, uh, nonetheless, yeah. what? Anyway, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the success of, the, of John's group uh, uh, 
led to interest on the, on the part of the Wellcome Trust uh, uh, for ex uh, expanding their effort into human sequencing uh, and eventually leading uh, the, to the creation of uh, what was first the Sanger Center and now the Sanger Institute uh, just south of Cambridge. Uh, so with, with this, uh, we started thinking more seriously about how we could uh, extend our efforts more systematically to take on the human genome. Uh, and by the fall of 1990, uh, 1980, uh, 1994, uh, we presented our, uh, our plan, our ideas for how the human could be done uh, at both the NHGRI uh, and to the Wellcome Trust. Uh, there are some stories there. Uh, we can go, uh, we can do those later. Uh, but, but I think the end result was uh, that the community finally uh, started taking seriously the idea that Sanger sequencing uh, might be up to the task of uh, sequencing the human genome, uh, provided that there was continuing uh, improvement of this kind of incremental uh, twofold a year uh, kinds of things. It didn't need uh, a revolutionary uh, breakthrough in technology. Uh, and the plan that we outlined at the time uh, was remarkably close to what was actually followed with uh, in the end, uh, although there were uh, <coughs> severe uh, swings back and forth between that and where we, when we finally got there. But uh, that eventually led uh, the NHGRI uh, to fund several pilot projects uh, and across the world uh, at, in various, in many countries, uh, efforts were begun uh, at sequencing the human genome. So uh, that led the uh, Wellcome Trust and the NHGRI uh, to convene the first Bermuda meeting in 1996 uh, to coordinate these uh, growing efforts across the world. And coordination was indeed uh, badly needed. There were uh, about as many ideas on how to sequence the genome as there were uh, groups present at, in the Bermuda meetings. Uh, lots of different ideas of how, of how it would work best. And one uh, in one form or another taking advantage of Sanger sequencing. Um, and there was also the, uh, because people were focused on, on uh, I don't know, impact, I would say, there was a lot of interest uh, in, in trying to sequence uh, the few genes that had been discovered in the last year. Uh, our group, in fact, uh, had sequenced exactly the same clone uh, that Andre Rosenthal had sequenced in Germany uh, just before the meeting, and this was, we found this out. Uh, this led Francis Collins uh, to describe this as a, a sort of the likelihood of a car wreck in the Sahara. Uh, <laughs> But nonetheless, it was a challenge. Uh, so we had, we had all these different groups all pursuing different agendas, uh, and uh, there needed to be some uh, heavy coordination. Uh, so, but there was, uh, there was another important topic uh, beyond that, uh, and that was how to deal with the data. Uh, there, human sequencing, human sequence had already been patented. Uh, the tradition in human genetics uh, was not what it was in the worm community. Uh, in fact, uh, even after publication, uh, sequence was often not released uh, beyond what was necessary to support the publication. Uh, and so how could you organize a, and coordinate an effort to sequence the human genome uh, when, when people were not releasing their data, even to one another? Uh, and so we had, in one of the last sessions, uh, we debated all these issues. Uh, uh, and it's important to know that it wasn't just scientists at the meeting, uh, but there were, the, there were government representatives there as well. Uh, some of the projects had support uh, from their governments basically with the idea that they were going to, going to hold turf, that they were going to have uh, intellectual property. Uh, and so it was a tough discussion. Uh, and, but in the end, uh, we agreed to the following uh, 
pr uh, principles. And uh, this is actually a photograph of the whiteboard uh, of, the, of the things as the group uh, uh, discussed them. And you can see uh, it was a work in progress. Uh, but the, the uh, important points are that there was going to be automatic release of uh, sequence as long as it was greater than uh, assembled sequence, uh, greater than a KB. Uh, any finished annotated sequence was going to be uh, 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 submitted immediately. Uh, and it was going to, the idea w was agreed to that it, all the sequence should be a feel freely available uh, to for both research and development uh, to recognize its benefits to, to society. And, in, and at the bottom, the funding agencies are urged to foster these principles. Obviously, this is just a group of scientists uh, getting together talking. Uh, we didn't have any, uh, uh, any real force, uh, and so it was important that the funding agencies uh, go along with it and, uh, and put their put their persuasion behind it. Uh, I should say that uh, while the, there was uh, uh, agreement among the scientists, the, the government representatives had to be more reserved. Uh, several of them had to go back to their countries. And, uh, and indeed, uh, in one case, it took a couple years uh, before uh, the policy was adopted. Uh, and, but it was. Uh, and, uh, and as Eric said, it had a, uh, had a major impact on, I think, both uh, uh, policy long term, but also in terms of how the Genome Project uh, was perceived uh, by the community. Even in the mid-90s, there was still a lot of uh, skepticism about the value of the, of the Genome Project and how it was going to benefit people, and I think uh, this helped to, to allay the concerns. And John's talk is going to pick up uh, and explore uh, some of these issues more. Anyway, uh, we kept sequencing. And by 1998, uh, we had the first worm sequence. Uh, and it was, uh, wasn't quite uh, complete. There were still some uh, very sticky regions. Uh, but it was about uh, 97 megabases of the 100 megabase genome. And we knew those that last 3% uh, would require uh, highly specialized efforts. And indeed, uh, the last gap was, uh, was completed, I think, in about 2002 uh, with Alan Coulson, the last person still working. Uh, but it was done. And I think today it's uh, rem probably because it doesn't have uh, highly centralized uh, centromeres with all that stuff in between. Uh, it remains the only uh, animal genome that's complete uh, from telomere to telomere. Uh, it's, it's highly accurate, we're proud to say, uh, and we've been able to validate that uh, in the last couple of years in, in my lab. We've sequenced uh, 2,000 worm genomes, uh, and with different technologies, it's, it's just amazing to think that we spent eight years sequencing the first genome, and in the last uh, two years, we've done 2,000. With two people, um, so it's a it's a little different operation today. But but the result is that we have uh, thirty two thousand x coverage of the worm genome, uh, and we've been able to find uh, the few remaining errors, uh, and we're not, and these are now being corrected. So we think we have a highly accurate reference sequence. But the, but the accuracy was roughly on the order of uh, one in, one in 40,000 bases uh, uh, or so. Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, we, we had done that. Uh, as Eric said, 1998 came uh, with its own challenges. Uh, I'm going to skip over all of that. Uh, because it was just lots more uh, and lots, lots, lots more. Uh, many groups uh, joined. I think there were uh, 13 different groups across the world uh, who contributed. Uh, we like to think that because of the uh, Wash U Sanger connection, uh, making it, anchoring it as an international project uh, made it easier for groups across the world to join. Uh, and it, and as Eric said, uh, by 
2001, uh, we had a draft sequence. Uh, that was followed quickly by the, by the mouse. Uh, a draft of that in 2002, uh, and then the chimpanzee genome. And of course, uh, that was, those, were, those are all draft sequences. Uh, importantly though, while all this was going on, uh, the groups uh, continued to sequence uh, the rest of the human genome, uh, trying to make it in high quality. You can see that uh, people were not so interested in the final version as they were uh, the draft version. Uh, we didn't even get top billing in this, in this uh, issue of Nature. The, it's down here, uh, the, going the last mile. Uh, and even that uh, still had problems. There were still gaps. Uh, Evan Eichler uh, in my department constantly reminds me of the shortcomings of the map uh, in, in, in complicated regions, uh, and, the, and to their credit, they are sorting those out. Uh, it's an important source of variation. Uh, so this is 2004. Uh, I guess the 10-year anniversary is an anniversary of the announcement <laughs> of the completion. I was th when, I, when we heard about the 10th anniversary, I was trying to figure out what, what anniversary. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the genome project, we've learned that there's an anniversary any year. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, uh, the, I, importantly, all of the sequence is out there uh, in the public domain, uh, and as I said, uh, John's talk is going to explore uh, the consequences of having it out there for everybody uh, to, to uh, use. You can, you know, your high, a high school student can call it up and use it as they like. So with that, uh, before closing, I want to thank all the people, uh, many, many people uh, who uh, have, I've been fortunate enough to work with through the years, uh, my colleagues at the University of Washington now, Washington University before that. Most people don't even know those are different institutions. <laughs> um, people at the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and the Sanger Institute now, uh, especially the worm community, uh, for working closely with us throughout the years uh, and providing the model uh, to convince our colleagues in Bermuda that it was the right thing to do. Uh, EMBL, the EBI uh, colleagues, and uh, John's colleagues at the University of Manchester. Uh, but as it says, uh, opinions are our own. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer questions, and John can join me for the questions for sure. I think we, we can do questions. We can do some questions now, and then, and then more questions after John finishes. Yes. You got to go to a microphone. So Bob, was there any resistance in the worm community to your data sharing model? Was there any bad behavior that you had to deal with there and to provide a model for what might happen for human genome sequencing? Um, there, there. I, I don't think there was resistance. Um, it was voluntary. You didn't have to, if you wanted to share clones with a, with the mapping group, uh, that was fine. Uh, and if you did, though, you you had to expect that it would be uh, published. But there were some, as John indicated, there were some sticky issues because there were competing efforts. Certainly I was involved in, in one where, uh, where there was information that we had to share and, uh, and wanted to make sure that people were playing fairly. There were, uh, and when we got to sequencing, there were some issues uh, as well. Uh, you know, it was unfinished sequence. Uh, there was one publication that, uh, that thought there were several pseudogenes uh, because they hadn't checked with us to make sure that the sequence was actu actually fully correct in those regions, and, uh, and those were just sequencing errors. They thought they were pseudogenes. So there were, there were hiccups like that. Uh, there was not, in terms of the sequencing effort itself, there was uh, 
many people in the Mormon community thought that uh, that we were taking resources from the from the biologists, and that this was not a good thing to do. But but that was a common reaction across the whole community. Yes. Uh, that, Bob. Oh yes, John. Can I join in? Absolutely. Um, yeah, quick. Yeah, quick comment on that. Yes. I looked it up, I mean, in 1991 at the worm meeting, a lot of people were coming up and complaining, exactly as you said, about taking resources. In 1993, it was quite the opposite, because by then, the sequence of the worm was being exploited and making the worm more powerful in the areas of sequence than the fly, and people were actually getting, beginning to get grants on the basis of having the genome available. So we actually saw, in a couple of years or so, that switch around from you know, not seeing why resources should be spent and not seeing the point to realizing how valuable it was. Yeah, I, I, that's an that's a, that's a excellent point uh, because by 1991, you know, we had a few cosmets sequenced. Uh, we had an impact on almost nobody. Uh, but by 93, we had a couple megabases, and even that was only a couple percent of the genome, but people were able to do this. And, uh, I remember a, a story about uh, Bob Horvitz and his competition for postdocs with Jerry Rubin, uh, and the tide yeah. had turned. <laughs> so, yeah. if you look back on on these past uh, projects that that got you here, is there anything that you wish you did differently that may have that may have changed the the outcome or the timing? Oh, there were lots of things I would have liked to have done differently. I think it's, do we know where this is coming from? They're working on it. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's a, I mean, there were many things that we could have changed and done better. Uh, uh, I don't think there are, I, I don't, I don't have the sense that there are any major uh, snafus that we would have, that we would have done. Uh, I, I guess I will, one thing I would I would wish is that we had a, a more disciplined response to the to Craig's challenge. But <laughs> but it worked out. Rudy, or I'll go ahead. So when you were describing the uh, early days of building the physical map and then overlaying a genetic map on that, I was sitting here and I couldn't help but think, if we were doing that now. Uh, there'd be a data coordinating center, there'd be a requirement to deposit it in NCBI, <laughs> that everybody would have ready access to it th through that. And so what did you do in the early 1980s? Somebody was writing this out in a notebook. Were you using carrier pigeons to get information <laughs> back and forth? Can you talk about the challenges of just exchanging the information in the absence of an internet? Uh, it was 19... 90, well, 1985, not 1885. <laughs> <laughs> but I also saw the pieces of paper at Cold so, Spring Harbor. So, uh, I mean, that, there, were, there were challenges. Uh, I mean, the paper was actually to, to make a, a, a point to, to just be able to lay out the whole thing in a way that would, would be hard to do on a, on a small computer screen. I mean, you know, I think on, I, I think that scale was about 2,000 bases to the millimeter or something like that mm -hmm. to lay across the, the back of Bush Hall. Uh, so that 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 was part of the point. Uh, certainly, uh, John and Alan were making uh, computers were central to keeping track of the data, and and John can comment more on that. Uh, and and we did have uh, Bitnet. Uh, by the time I got involved in it. Uh, I think for the first couple years, John, it really was through the Worm Breeders Gazette that you were and, and mailing back and forth. But by the time I got involved, we really did have uh, places across the country where you could access it. And you can describe that in more detail, I'm sure, John. 
Well, yes, I, I, I wrote a program which came to be called Contig9, which was uh, just a, a graphing program, but it also included a, a, an element of automation for, for joining things up. We kept it somewhat under manual control. It wasn't something where you just threw in all the fingerprints and it would assemble, um, but, but it, it helped you. But the important thing were the graphics, and having got it digitized in that way, then, of course, I could uh, devise mailing programs. And because BitNet was, very, BitNet was very slow, even that graphic that you see on the back of the hall of taking a very long time to send. And so what we did was to send update files to the centers, and then they distributed them further. So we took advantage, and actually, of the, of the gradually growing power of the, of, the, of the connections. And I would say exactly the same thing happened with the sequence, you know. We tracked, I would say, the power of the sequencing machines, and in some ways contributed to them during the 90s now, jumping from the map to the sequence. That was the limitation. It was how much sequence we could get out per day, and we were doing all we could with it. And that was the, the doubling of the speed each, each time, was us keeping up with our, with our wet chemistry and the software, yes, but we were absolutely dependent on the growing power of the sequences themselves. And so it was with the map and the internet. Yeah, just in terms of the bitnet, I would, I would send John an email. I mean, this is not, you know, this is five sentences or something. And I would watch the echo come back on my screen as it went to North St. Louis, to Champaign-Urbana, to Indianapolis. <laughs> uh, then it would sit there for a couple hours. <laughs> uh, and then it would, find, it would finally land in France uh, before it get, got to England. Uh, and uh, just a simple mail like that uh, might take overnight. Yes. Thank you very much. I wanted to just um, ask you about your perception historically about this, the good of sharing, um, which I think it really has created this concept of the positive. Sharing is a good thing. And when you first made the proposal in the worm newsletter, it was about worms. And I just wonder if you could just speculate if you think there would have been a different uptake if it had been sharing about humans rather than worms back oh, then. I, I mean, the, the ethos was completely different in the communities. Uh, and part of it was that the worm community was small. Uh, there was nothing at stake. Right. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, basically all of us had, uh, had a shared experience. Uh, we came through Sydney's lab, or in the later years, we were people were the uh, intellectual grandchildren or great grandchildren of Sydney's lab, uh, and so that sense of community was strong. Uh, it was uh, there was also a sense, I would say, of us against them. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the much bigger and uh, much more robust uh, fly community. Uh, and so there were all of these things contributed to a, a very strong sense of uh, community within the group. Uh, and and, and in, in large part because of, because of that combined with the early use of the Worm Breeders Gazette, there had developed uh, uh, an etiquette of sharing so that you, you would put things in the Worm Breeders Gazette and you would not expect people to uh, take that project up and publish on it. Uh, uh, and if you, if you did something like that, uh, you were shunned. Uh, and so there was, there, the ethos of the, of the human genetics community was uh, just polar opposite, I think. Uh, I remember going to uh, meetings where people were uh, talking about doing mapping and the probes they used, and they were all uh, without information. Uh, there was just no way that anybody could, uh, the talks were given in a way that uh, there was uh, no useful information provided. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I mean, people, that I, I, I would urge people in the genetics, the human genetics community to counter me on that. Yes, Eric. Bob, let me ask one more question, then maybe we should transition to hear from John. But, but you know, I was there. I was a postdoc in the department down the hall from you yeah. during much of this era. Um, I should remind people, and I don't remember, I don't actually know the answer to the question I'm going to ask, even though I was there on, I was within yards of all of this. 
I mean, when the Genome Project began, the first genome centers were set up, um, and uh, one of them was set up at Washington University under David Schlesinger's um, uh, leadership. I was a participant in that, and I was a postdoc working in that. You were down the hall doing all the things you just described with, with, with the Salston group. But, you know, you guys were heavily focused on WORM. You were heavily focused on the goals of what you wanted to accomplish, and then you were, you made your play as successful to get the WORM sequenced as part of the Genome Project. There was some moment in there where both of you decided to stick your toe in the water and get involved in human genome sequencing. You didn't have to do that. You both had fantastic careers. You had gotten what you wanted. You had made your contribution. You could have gone back, as, as you've eventually done, and gone back and studied the other things in, in worm biology that, you, that interest you. But somehow, and you weren't part of the human genome center, but somehow both of you just kept finding your way into this rough and tumble world. I'm just, was there a moment where you said we're going to go for this, or was it that you wanted to have your sequencing groups have longevity and therefore saw that the human sequencing was it? And, and so that's sort of part A of the question, because I don't remember what that moment was. <laughs> part B is, what would you have done if the Bermuda meetings hadn't gone well? And that you oh. couldn't bring the ethos of the nematode community into the human community. Would you still have participated, or would you have said, the heck with this, let these human genomicists figure it out themselves? That's my two-part question. Okay. Uh, John? No. <laughs> um, In a minute. <laughs> all right. Uh, on the first, um, I think you couldn't be doing all this sequencing uh, without thinking about uh, the human. Uh, it's a, we, John and I were having, were in preparation for this, we were having an exchange of mails just trying to think about when we first started we first thinking that sequencing the worm would be possible. And, and it was there from the start. They, you know, the, it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't a realistic possibility, but thinking about the genome, you know, the map had an end in itself and was important in and of itself, but somewhere in the back of uh, Maynard's head in doing the, the yeast, and I think in the back of John's head, was that there was sequence behind this. Uh, and, and so that, you know, I, that was part of it. Uh, part of it was that there was, I would say, a, a great deal of pessimism uh, in the community that what we were doing in the worm would be applicable to human. Uh, and so we wanted, we, we wanted to try that, and, and we did, and we showed that it could do it. Uh, and then there was this aspect of the outside, uh, Merck coming to us, uh, getting us involved in the dirty world of human uh, genetics. Uh, and, and on the other end, uh, the Sanger, or the Welcome Trust coming to John, uh, we wanted to, we wanted to see, we, we needed money, resources to finish off the worm. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't immediately forthcoming. It was a lot of money to, to be committed to getting the, getting the worm finished. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we explored various possibilities to do that. Uh, and I, I think John's deal with the devil was that uh, he could get resources uh, if he committed to sequencing the human. Uh, is that about, is that fair, John? Yeah, no, I think you've put it exactly. It's a Faustian contract in my case. And, <laughs> and I think that probably led it. I, I, do, I do urge people, I hope you agree, Bob, to read the common thread. Oh, I was I, looking I through was... this again last night, and it really is laid out. We're all in there. You are all in there. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> who's involved in this is, and, and we detail these little stories. And they, uh, there was many more than we have time to go through now. And it is a fascinating road that was traveled. But I was, in the end, offered that deal. It wasn't that the Wellcome Trust would finance the sequencing of the worm, but they would provide the space which the MRC didn't have, and then the MRC was drawn in to, to finish the sequencing of our half of the worm. 
And I would say, coming back and linking this to the previous question, that we were trying, quite intrigued to take it forward. This level of cooperation on the mapping, I think, was unique to the worm community. When you think of all the other organisms, the people in the position of Bob and me and other people involved in the maps all fought. They all tried to have their own papers. You know, you had separate papers about yaks and about cosmids and about every other kind of clone. We were the ones who brought it together, and it was partly because of the community, but also we made it happen. And every worm meeting, there was quite a tense meeting with all those who were interested in the genome, and we would argue through cases about how to handle the, the awkwardnesses and so on. And then I mentioned yeah. already the thing about the resentment from the sequencing, and we got through that because everybody was persuaded. But it did take work, I think, to, to make it come together. We had a good start with the worm community, but it was made to work. And so going forward into the human, I think we did, as well as the Faustian contract, have a, a level of optimism, or at least a level of determination, to translate these feelings because we thought this is the way human genomics ought to go as well in the end. And it did, uh, sort of. And, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> and in answer to your, your second question, um, uh, fortunately it didn't happen that way, but my, uh, I think what we probably would have done is go back uh, and just release the sequence ourselves. Uh, it, was, it would actually have been easier than trying to get it into GenBank. I mean, GenBank wasn't happy about s accepting incomplete sequence or draft sequence, and That's true. we would have just posted it on the web on our own uh, and made the community see uh, what, what could, could happen. And if not in 97 and 98 or 99, uh, I think we would have won the day. Just a little historical footnote relevant to that. I was um, looking for a little while ago at the 1990 uh, report from NIH DOE on the Human Genome Project. And it turned out, I'd f totally forgotten this, but there was a data release policy there for physical mapping that all mapping information had to be released within six months uh -huh. of generation. Um, but that didn't galvanize, that didn't create the ethos. Yeah. The, the, it was Bermuda and it was, you know, the, the, the push by you guys and the example of the worm community that really got it to stick. And I, and I would guess that that six month wasn't fully honored. <laughs> All right, should I just turn it over to John? Okay, John, you're on. I'm gonna sit down, and, uh, but I'll be able to comment, I gather. Okay, I hope so. So you're going to lose me now, you're gonna get the slides instead, so bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can't see me. Well, it doesn't matter whether you can or not, but you can hear me all right, yes? Yes. Um, I would just like to, to start quickly by saying thank you very much for setting this up, the, the video link. I appreciate it. It's a lot of work for many people at your end as well as ours. Um, and I do have particular, I have family reasons why it's difficult for me to travel this month, so I'm grateful for that. However, I'm also very pleased that we can, uh, as it were, try out this technology because, after all, I have saved a, a jet seat, a jet, a jet fueled seat going to and fro across the Atlantic here, and I think it's something that we should be mindful of, that, that where we can usefully do this kind of linkage, and of course technology will improve, we should do so. And that sort of relates to, in, to, to some of the things I'm going to go on to say, so I thought it was reasonable to pop that in, but thank you above all for doing it. Now this, this slide uh, shows you the situation you would have if the human genome, as, as, as some people wanted, uh, was, uh, had, to be, had been uh, entirely proprietary. It would be locked up in the, in the little green circle there with a barrier that nobody could access it unless they had money, hence the dollar, dollar, dollar research. Researchers at the bottom, those without the dollar dollars can't get in. And furthermore, the dollar dollar guys have to make a binding contract with the proprietors of the database that they will not redistribute the data. Uh, otherwise, of course, the data would simply leak out and, and would be, um, would, there would no longer be a, a business plan. So they have a limitation, those guys, the, the privileged researchers, 
uh, they have a limitation on publication because they are not allowed under this sort of model uh, to tell people exactly what they're doing. They can talk maybe about the little tiny bit, but they would not be able to show the entire uh, genome and the map. And when you think about it, an awful lot of the work in investigating the genome uh, requires you to look right across it, to look at, for example, families of genes. So basically, not only is it something that is inappropriate for all the reasons that have come through so far, but it is not good science because you cannot communicate. What is the way to do it is to make the central data public, which is what, of course, we, we, we strove for and succeeded in. Then everybody has access without hindrance. Everybody can communicate. And yet, you can see the arrows going outwards on the outside. People are not inhibited from doing whatever they like with the data. What they cannot do is to block access to the central data. And so this is absolutely the right way to handle all kinds of pre-competitive data, uh, which is uh, both useful in the long term and useful to many people far beyond what you can immediately do at the time. And so this is, I think, the answer to the question of why has this been influential? Well, it is because it works. It's actually good science and it's good business. And many people will tell you this, that had the human data remained proprietary like this, people in, in industry say this, it would have been a disaster. Anyway, it was not. Now, I want just to very quickly uh, talk about a couple of, 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 of justifications for that. One is comparative genomics. Here's an old slide showing uh, the, the alignment of, of promoter sequences in four vertebrates. And um, you have a tremendous power when you can look at a number of genomes like this, line them up, and look for common features. So beyond the things you can recognize as coding for protein and so on, you can see things that are retained in evolutionary time. And those black boxes show the, the, the items that are identical, and indeed, they, in most cases, they turn out to be essential. That's why they have drifted apart in evolutionary time, whereas the, the other areas have drifted and are not essential, at least to making a vertebrate. Though, of course, among those, you will find the reasons why human is human and mouse is mouse and so on. Then again, you can use the genome going ahead, far, far ahead, for, for exploration. And so you can... You can make an inventory of elements. You can look for the things you know about already, the protein coding genes. You find uh, the whole lot as you, as you explore. You can look for other sorts of genes. But then you find whole new families of genes. I mean, the story of the, of the discovery of the microRNA genes, of which I think in, until the end of the 90s, there was just one example known in the worm, as it happens. And that was a, a, an unusual biological curiosity, and it turns out, of course, that there are hundreds of these, of these genes in, in the human once you have the sequence available to search properly for them. And so it goes on, and we now have come to the, to, to the, 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 the big program, which I'll get Bob to refer to in a moment, the ENCODE program, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, uh, which is the is the, uh, is the drawing together and the, and the continuing elaboration of, of all the things that can be discovered in the genome. So these are reasons for having it public and going on from the, the attainment of it being public. This is a little slide from ABI and I rather like it. It just illustrates the cascade of other sorts of data which grow out in some sense of the genome in that that carries the basic information of biology, uh, but also the etiquette, the, 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 the habit of sharing. We have preserved the three great public databases, which were under direct threat back in, back in 2000. They would be directly threatened that there was a better way to go, that the whole thing would be a corporate entity. We have kept those public databases, and they have continued to grow and prosper. As you go down the cascade, you find areas like, for example, protein structures, which are much nearer the possibility of commercial exploitation. And there, of course, you find people being a little more iffy uh, about what, what can be done. I want to just go to this one last slide before I come to Bob. And not last, but I mean the next slide before Bob. Um, the, the first thing you do, of course, and it was even growing out well before the human genome was finished, is to start looking for variation among individuals. These are medically important. You can make correlations. Uh, they're used in forensics, though on the whole slightly different markers are used there, but it's all there in the genome. And you can, uh, above all, as I see it, understand development. 
Um, there have been a series of major international projects, the HapMap, the, the general uh, system of genome-wide association studies, the discovery of copy number variants, which was another great unexpected uh, item that came out of the, of the genomes, and the, uh, now the thousand genome studies as, as next generation sequence goes forward. But Bob, would you like to comment on, the, on, the, on where we are? Because you, unlike me, have been actually working in all these areas uh, for the last 10 years. Well, uh, I, I, I've been doing worms, but I've been watching people in my department and others uh, uh, carry on these studies. And, and obviously, as this group knows, uh, the GWAS studies have, have been uh, uh, an enormous investment and, and success in, in terms of identifying hundreds of genes involved in pathways uh, behind common diseases, uh, and, and that's fueled lots of uh, research. Uh, copy number variants I hear all the time uh, about, uh, and their involvement in uh, autism uh, and schizophrenia and other diseases. Uh, these things, while as I alluded to, uh, in some regions of the, these are the really nasty regions of the genome, uh, if we hadn't uh, persisted to push things as far along as we could, uh, this would have been even harder to do. Um, and, and, I, and just having the sequence uh, makes things uh, possible with short reads. Uh, the, the higher the quality of the sequence, uh, the more meaningful. Uh, these uh, these short read uh, sequence projects can be. So uh, I, all of these have uh, uh, been key. And, and just back to John's point about the promoter and the other regions of the genome, uh, in the early days, it's hard to believe, but there was a big effort or a big community that thought it was actually uh, all we needed to do was sequence the protein coding genes. Uh, yeah. And because that other 98 percent of the genome was, uh, was worthless. Uh, so uh, it's a path not taken for good reason. <laughs> yes, it's a very good point, Bob. It's a gamble that really paid off doing the whole thing. We were suspicious that we might need it, and so it is. Now, all of this leads one to the possibility of medical advances, beginning straight away with diagnostics. And, and the possibility of personalized treatment simply from the correlations without understanding them um, of, the, of, the, uh, of the genotype with the phenotype. Uh, but going on, of course, this is the basis for looking for, for, for drug targets that, that where we can actually uh, do therapies and, and on, uh, although in very early days yet because of delivery problems, to gene replacement therapy. So we, we have a cascade of, 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 of prospects for that. And now I'm going to sort of move towards a couple of issues which are, are really the, the coming towards the social effects of, of these advances and the openness must, that must go with them. Because the, what Bob has just been talking about, it's very important, not only that the sequence is there, but that it's available to everybody. Now, one thing that's just come to prominence, actually, as a result of the work at MIT looking at the possibility of identifying individuals uh, as part of the Thousand Genome Project, and also particularly as a part of, uh, of gene genealogical, genealogical databases uh, in which their family history and their names are, are listed. And it's because of these combinations of databases that actually, as genetic data becomes more commonplace, uh, and it will soon be affordable, of course, to complete, complete genetic data from everybody, data will leak out. We cannot stop it. We shall constantly find that data will leak out. I'm not going to say much about this because George Church uh, will certainly be talking about this in the, in the next paired uh, seminars, uh, but I would simply make very clear that in my opinion, and I think this is some, a view that everybody is coming to, that society needs a principle of genetic equity in some way or another. Genetic information should not be used, must not be used to limit the e equality uh, between human beings. Um, we are taking some steps in this direction. In the US, um, you, you, have the, um, you, have, you have GINA, um, the, the act that, that prohibits people from using genetic information adversely for health and employment. 
Um, and uh, in, the, in the UK, in the UK actually we didn't need that because we have the National Health Service and so we automatically protected as far as health is concerned. But we have not taken the formal step about employment and it may be that, that the UK will have to do that in due course. So there are practical measures you can do. This equity is not just a philosophical term, it actually means statutory provision so that people cannot be disadvantaged. Now, of course, that's not to say we should not be confidential at all. Um, it's a matter of human dignity uh, that, 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 that one should not you sort of spray people's genetic data all over the place. But as people are finding, for example, even things that they would like to have private, uh, like, for example, uh, uh, which, exactly which children you've fathered in some cases, <laughs> is not really realistically uh, going to be a secret thing in the future. So, for number one, genetic equity. Number two, get over it. And so the future generations will not be, be, be sort of so concerned about these things. And now I'm going to spend the next few minutes uh, going to a, an aspect of, of data release which concerns me very much, and this is what I've really been involved with in the last few years in thinking about. And to, to I use this little cycle, this diagram, to illustrate something about the way science operates. Now up here... Um, if you can see my little marker going round, this is what I would call the cycle of science. So we discover stuff, we build up knowledge, and, and if we put it together in a, sense, a clever way, we can, we can get understanding, and that feeds back to more discovery. So science wants to do this sort of thing. Science has to be funded. It can be funded either in a not-for-profit fashion or a for-profit fashion. And the output of science is important. We often forget that science is the greatest cultural activity of our times, and I mean that. Science drives culture in a way uh, which is, is, is sort of unprecedented because we learn so much, and science is used, or the products of science are used all the time throughout the arts, and are really are a are, are major part of, of humanity's exploration altogether now of itself and the world around. But we can also use, use science, and we, most people think of science this way, as providing useful applications. Uh, we hope that they're mostly good. We occasionally manage to produce harmful ones, which we have to try and suppress a bit. Uh, and these applications, anyway, can give some revenue which can feed back. So this is a very good cycle and, and, and looks great, and that's the way we operate. Now, what's been happening in the last 50 years uh, in my career, in biology in particular, is that because other sciences were in different states of this development, in biology, after the, 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 the beginning of molecular biology, became more and more powerful, and, and more and more there were possibilities of, of for-profit applications which are driving the cycle rather strongly in this fashion. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to, to jump. Um, which are driving this, this cycle rather strongly in this fashion. And we are finding that there is relatively less uh, not-for-profit revenue now uh, compared with the for-profit revenue in many areas. Now, up to a point, this is grand. I mean, this is, this is really providing a lot more resource to science. We are learning a lot more, and we are doing, doing a lot of very beneficial things with it. But we should examine a little bit what we're doing. We are securing revenue more and more through the exercise of intellectual profit, profit, the intellectual property. Now, I call this relatively easy money, though anybody who's written a grant proposal might uh, beg to differ. But the fact is that, that people don't much like paying taxes, and they do rather like a flutter. And so the, the idea of investing with the possibility of, of something, uh, money in your pocket afterwards, is more attractive. And so uh, that, that, that makes, that's why it's somewhat easier to get hold of. It's also free of central control. And, and so somebody starting a, a company, a startup company, has a very large measure of freedom uh, to do what they like. But, of course, there are investors in that startup and they want a return. And by the way, we are all investors through our, through our mutual funds. This is a point that, that I shall come back and emphasize. Now, that means that the R&D gets channeled into profitable markets, as I've indicated on the, on the previous diagram, and this sort of tends to exclude or inhibit uh, some of the, of the other needful things we should be doing. So we change the balance of the, uh, between different kinds of science uh, that, that we are doing, and that is to our loss if we miss out on things that are either immediately socially beneficial or we need for the future. And we put a little bit of a, of a downer on scientific communication. Uh, we'll come back and talk a bit more about that later on. Now, 
intellectual property is driven or is based on, on the exclusive rights patenting of, 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 of things that are discovered. And in the early days, although we had the, 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 the genome um, free and in the public domain, this was not true of, of genes that could be identified with particular uh, medical conditions. And so people would identify these and they would say, look, I have a, I, have a, 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 I understand uh, this gene is, is causing or the a mutant is causing a particular uh, medical condition and I know how to diagnose it. So I'm going to have a patent. And of course, that's entirely reasonable that one should have a, a kit that is patented. What one might think is perhaps a little less reasonable is to extend that kind of, of patent filing to cover all ways of diagnosing the gene. Uh, we, we, you sort of begin to think, well, I seem to have patented the idea of a mousetrap, not my own particular version of it, which is actually at variance with the history of, of patenting as it's been. But what was much worse, and because this, was, this went through very rapidly and people weren't setting the bar appropriately, is that that same sort of information was used to exclude all other uses of the gene, including pathways into the future, the much longer, more difficult pathways to therapy, and possibly pathways leading to, to new functions. So we've, we've really um, patented in a way which is, is, is not based on the, the correct definition of patents as being novel and inventive and useful. We've only taken the, the, the so, something of novelty and, and extended it to cover everything else. Now, this is not manufactured. This is, this is, in fact, it really happened. And the notorious case, which I'm going to talk briefly about because it's in the news again now, is the case of myriad genetics and the two breast cancer genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. I call them breast cancer genes because certain mutations in these genes uh, could have, give, give, give women a very high uh, chance of breast cancer, and indeed men too in some cases. Um, the, uh, these are only a small proportion of all cases of breast cancer, but if you have these genes in your family, these variants, then you have a very high chance, and so you want to be tested. But because Myriad has the complete America, uh, US portfolio on these genes, it's able to charge an exorbitant price for what is actually a very simple bit of sequencing of the DNA of these people. Now, these patents were, or challenge was raised back in 2009 by a consortium of women's groups uh, led by ACLU lawyers. Um, many of us were involved in this, including in, in, in due course a, a, an amicus curiae statement from some of the National Institutes of Health. Um, but um, initially, they were, they were actually ruled invalid on the, on the grounds, which the general grounds I've given, that you cannot own a human gene or patent an entire human gene in this fashion because you don't have the, the correct perquisites for doing so. Uh, they were they ruled invalid by Judge Sweet um, in, in the New York District Court. And then they went to the appeal court uh, where Myriad's lawyers were able to, turn, to overturn them. From there, they went on appeal to the Supreme Court. They came back to the Appeals Court, which once again overturned them. And now ACLU is, has, has got a, a, um, an, a, a, the, the, the right or the, the agreement that they can go back again yet again to the, the Supreme Court, not for this case alone, but for considering whether or not it's appropriate to patent human genes in that ring-fencing manner that I described. So you may patent, you have process patents on human genes, obviously, for particular things you can do, but not to take a whole human gene on the basis of a small amount of knowledge. There's one other thing before moving on I want to point out, because I think it's extraordinarily revealing about the whole system, and that is the, the three appeal court judges were in great disagreement. One actually agreed with the original judgment uh, of Judge Sweet and said, yes, that's right, the, the, the patents are invalid. A second judge said, no, that's not true at all. The, the genes once isolated uh, and put in a test tube are different uh, from nature and so can be patented. The third judge was very interesting. Judge Moore said, well, I'm not sure I can see the arguments, but the PTO has for a long time approved patents of this kind and industry has relied on them and so the patents must stand. Now, that is not a good reason for going forward. What it would say is that any pat no patent can ever be overturned because people have got used to it. 
would be a very poor way of developing patent law. So I think it's very important. If you, I recommend that you, you look at this case. It's not, and it's not uninteresting because of the details of that kind that I've outlined, and you can see on the ACLU website and follow that up. But now coming back to our cycle, the consequence of this kind of, 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 of continued pressure has resulted to, to some degree in a sort of short-circuiting of the, of the process so that the main thing that science gets driven for in certain areas, and pharmaceuticals unfortunately is one, is that the applications are mostly for profit and the, uh, the result of that is that we cannot work uh, by, by the, by the, by, by the for-profit mechanisms available for R&D uh, on, on things that matter. The consequence is that, that we work on uh, masses of, 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 um, of uh, molecules uh, that are, can be potentially bought by the richer communities of the world, but not at all on, on treatments that would be, or very little, on treatments that are needed for the greater part of the disease burden of the world. And so we have this notorious issue of the neglected diseases. A little bit of change in that, uh, but um, uh, not much and not enough. And it's a defect, you see, of having a system where people can own knowledge. You see how it relates back to what we were doing with the genome and how we handled that. Looking further around the cycle, um, we see that what we are doing through all this, not only uh, making applications mostly for profit, but very curiously, the way the, 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 the process operates, looking up over here, is that the vastly greater part of the revenue goes into profit and marketing and lobbying. Only about 15% actually comes back to the scientific process. So those who say, as, as, as many do, that, oh, we must have this system, we see its imperfections, but we must have this system because this is the only way we can get revenue uh, for, for, doing, for, for, for curing diseases, well, think, 15% of drug revenue is a pretty inefficient way uh, in my view, of doing biomedical research. So I think this is, this is not very satisfactory. But I keep on saying we are doing this because we are all shareholders in this business. It's not there, there is some bunch of people doing it. We are all shareholders through our savings, our pensions, our mutuals. We are all part of this process. And if we don't think it's a very good way of doing it, we should get down and change it. Now, I talked about the, the problems for, the, for the, uh, the less developed countries of the world, the poorer countries who uh, are not getting treatments as, as they should in, in, a, in, a, in a more uh, equitable world. But we also have problems nearer home, and that's the, the excesses of marketing that are applied, which are distorting our medical systems. Um, the, the lobbying in Congress and the, in, in Brussels, uh, the incentives to physicians to prescribe certain drugs rather than the others. Uh, patient groups, are, when funded, are pressured to, to use particular products. The whole testing procedure is very inefficient because it's too adversarial. Uh, the, 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 uh, the medical journals are full of ghost publications written by marketing departments and signed off by, by, by academics sometimes. And, and the, uh, the bottom one that refers to the extension of, of particular drugs uh, beyond their, their immediate utility into, um, into novel or, or, or inappropriate uh, applications. Now, this actually, despite the, the example I gave you, the myriad patents are, are quite near their end, a couple of years to go, but it's important to think about these things because we have an awful lot in the future, and that's what I'm going to turn to. Pharmacogenetics is, is, a, is a word which we throw around a great deal and it's beginning to come into practice, um, not as fast as, as we may, may, might like because there's obviously huge potential here, uh, but we need to have some sort of um, more equitable treatment of, of products, of pharmaceuticals coming out, some sort of more open treatment in order to exploit these, 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 these ways in which we can use genetics. So that, for example, um, the, the, some drugs like warfarin that are used uh, for, for anti-clotting um, are very important to tailor the dose according to patients' needs. And we can do that uh, to some degree by genetics or by other kinds of testing. But what it means is that there should not be a pressure to sell more of the drug. It should be simply used in an appropriate way. Because of the adversarial climate, many drugs are thrown out because of rare adverse reactions 
uh, but this may well not be, not be necessary if we can find genetic correlates of that adverse reaction and use it only for patients who are going to respond properly. And so we begin to find cases like that. Herceptin is an example where you, you genetically test people in order to see whether they'll uh, be responsive or not. Uh, but it, you can see that having a patent of strongly IP patenting landscape where everything's siloed is going to make it much more difficult to cope with these in the future. Another very important example is multi-gene testing. This is an old slide. This goes back to 12 or 10 years or so ago. But I remember this appearing in Nature and being tremendously excited, although this is not the, the, the most powerful way of testing now in these days of RNA-seq. But this is um, a chip from, from the company Rosetta, um, which uh, shows how in the, the, you can distinguish uh, to some extent between breast cancer tumors that are liable to spread and those that aren't, according to the pattern of expression of genes. And the pattern of expression um, above this dotted line, roughly speaking, uh, these are good. Very few people will, will go into, will, will experience metastasis and, and, uh, and go out of remission, uh, whereas, uh, so they probably don't need or didn't have very aggressive chemotherapy, whereas those down here are very likely uh, to, to have spreading cells and will we'll need further treatment. And there are, there are now uh, kits, things are going on, as I say, RNA-seq is being used and more and more genes are being looked at in more subtle ways. But now this can be completely impeded as, um, as uh, Bob Cook Deegan and his colleagues warned us a few years ago that uh, if, they, if, if we have extensive pattern thickets so that every gene is owned, quotes, by somebody um, and has to be licensed separately. And so at this point, uh, Bob, may I ask you to, to comment on how serious you think this problem is? And indeed, actually, whether it is a problem or if, as some say, that intellectual property and licensing of genes is actually a positive thing for going forward in these, in these ways. Well, I can, I can certainly chime in here. I mean, uh, cert in terms of uh, just whole genome analysis, uh, I, maybe if you're a company and you want to just uh, study particular genes, you can not report on the breast cancer gene. But uh, from our standpoint, uh, doing either whole exome or whole genome sequencing, uh, the idea of blocking off uh, parts of the genome uh, and not being able to look at them, either not sequence them in the first place or not analyze them or not tell the patient. Uh, it just seems to me to be a non-starter. And the overhead of trying to uh, get all the rights to communicate all this and to pay all the fees is, uh, is uh, really not tenable. But I think in another aspect, uh, if we're really going to harness the, uh, the information in the genome, we're going to have to be able to amass large numbers of genomes uh, with lots of clinical information about them. And if we don't have uh, the full set of information about each of these genomes, if, if parts of them are blocked off, if, we, if the use of those genomes has to be, has to go through uh, IP issues for everybody, uh, it's just not going to work. Uh, we, we, we want to be in a situation for variation like we are with the genome, so that if you're a high school student in Kansas, uh, you can get access to this information and make discoveries it's, uh, any, so that anybody can figure out what's going on. Well, back to you, Thanks John. very much. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So um, ideally then, we would like to rebalance the cycle. It requires that, that uh, we don't drive discovery quite so hard with full profit. There's nothing wrong with the full profit. It's great uh, where, where, it's where it's appropriately gained, but uh, we need to have enough not-for-profit coming in to make that healthy cycle where everything can be done. We can do the important cultural things. After all, what is the human journey really other than culture going forward? What are we doing all this for? I would suggest that we are doing science at least in part to understand 
and 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 in fact i would say entirely to understand but we can we can maybe get a few a few little widgets along the way but the important thing is the journey and we do not want to have that inhibited by this short circuiting of the process but of course then we do need to go on doing medical research so what's happening well this rather complicated list of slides is just to indicate the broad range of of of, of ways in which people are tinkering with the process uh, these used to be called public-private partnerships. They now, in some sort of euphemistic way, are being called product development partnerships. But basically, they're using um, non-not-for-profit money uh, partnered with companies in order to unblock, uh, for example, uh, malarial drugs uh, that were stuck in the system because the marketing department wasn't willing to fund their, their, their development any further. And so you have this idea of partnerships. You can also uh, have various um, ways of changing the licensing landscape. Patent pooling, for example, is something which is, is being talked about quite a bit at the moment. Compulsory licensing is being used by, uh, by, by some of the developing countries, but it's being strongly lobbied against by the, by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the other systems have been discussed, um, global treaties, prizes, special incentives, and um, I haven't got on the list here, but I'd want to allude to, of course, the um, NIH's own National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, which is a very exciting experiment that's being set up now. But in all of these cases, I would bring you down to the bottom line here. If we use intellectual property on a level playing field as a way of people doing good trading with one another in a fair way, then it's a good servant. If we use, as we are, intellectual property in a global way in which those who have most dominate against those who have least, then it becomes a bad master. It's setting, actually, human ethics, human medical practice in a way which is utterly inappropriate for this a commercial tool. And so I think we need to watch out for intellectual property. Good servant, bad master, and it's getting in the way if we allow it. And I would go further, and I, I apologize for the way I'm, I'm, I'm moving here. I've, I've had quite a strong experience sharing the Royal Society's um, report, People in the Planet, which is broadly the, the impact of people on the planet and the impact on, on us, on our well-being as a result. And it's come to my realization and our working group's realization of, of how these are not solitary issues. This is not just about biomedical research. It is about the way we run global economics. It's about the limitations of gross domestic product as a measure. Gross domestic product is just the sum total of financial transactions. It's it comes very strongly to my mind that the, this dreadful oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico that the UK and the US were sort of jointly involved in through their various companies and their, 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 their regulatory apparatus, that oil spill cost an enormous amount to clean up, meanwhile doing huge amounts of damage to, to the environment and to, to the fishing industry around the Gulf. And all of that money got added to the GDPs of the US and the UK. That doesn't make sense, does it? It should have been subtracted. So I just point out, GDP is, 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 is a mindless financial transaction. We need alternative sorts of indices if we can make them work. We need ones that account for natural capital, so we actually cost what we're doing to the environment directly, and that measure real wealth, including the effect on human well-being. It'll be extremely hard, although people are experimenting with these things, to change because GDP is the currently accepted standard. And we're all implored by our governments to go out shopping, to get out of recession, to go for more competitive growth. But what we're doing as we do that is to drive material consumption, to drive emissions. Now, you may feel I've come a very long way from the DNA, and yet I hope you can see that this is really turning back to the beginning, because we're talking about the way we use knowledge, the way we share the benefit of knowledge and of science. And that should be done by everybody having access, by having equitable trading, openness, opportunity. We don't have brain drains just of, of taking the world's best scientists and concentrating them in the richest countries, but rather giving them opportunities 
uh, as countries level up and have more possibilities of doing the very best research in each of them so everybody has good career prospects. If we can do that, we are expanding justice. And when we think about the planet, we are thinking particularly about justice for future generations. Consuming too much now, governing economically in the wrong way now, is doing an enormous disservice, possibly a fatal disservice, to our children, our grandchildren, and their children. And we are not building a sustainable world. So I want these messages to go forward in the broadest way. We understand where they come from, and we've described through our history with the worm and the human and the sequencing, but they are much broader than that. These are principles of life for an equitable world. Thank you ever so much. You should come up and we can just sort of pick up on any theme people want just in the last five minutes or so. I, mean, I guess I'll start. John, I, I, you had so many great things to say. I'm curious, especially in some of this later work, who in the United States in particular are you working with or you think, or if, even if you're not working with directly, or you think is sort of a thought leader in, in similar ways of, of, of your thinking? Well, it's Bob, of course. <laughs> um, um, I mean, just to, I mean, there are so many people who are involved in these things. But one particular person I point to who was on our working group for the Royal Society study is Joel Cohen at Rockefeller, also at Columbia. And he is, he is a terrific guy. Who, who's, he's written a very fine book on the, on the human carrying capacity of the earth. And, and he is a very wise figure. But above all, I look to everybody. I look to, I'm very excited by, these, by um, President, President Obama's second term. I don't have the privilege of working directly with him, but I do hope that he will feel the opportunity to make some progress in these matters, in climate change in particular. So um, I, think, I think this is something for everybody, not just for a, a few collaborat collaborations. Okay. Any other questions from the floor? If not, uh, John, that was spectacular, Bob, as I knew it would be spectacular. I think this has been a terrific session. I've learned a lot, um, and it's just been it's just wonderful to hear from both of you. So I thank both of you greatly for your willingness to do this. Thank the audience for participating, and stay tuned. We have more of these to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.